Hello and welcome to Dear Hank and John. Or as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. It's a comedy podcast in which me and my brother John answer your questions. We'll give you some dubious advice and bring you all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. Hank, we've got a very special guest today. My uh, my daughter Alice is here in the studio with me. Hi, Uncle Hank. Oh, hi, Alice. And now she's off uh, to go watch uh, Elmo. <laughs> How are you, Hank? I'm good. How uh, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, we raised $1.5 million in the 2015 Project for Awesome uh, for organizations including Save the Children and the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees, and that is very exciting to me. It is very exciting, uh, and, and somewhat unexpectedly, a thing that I did not know was going to happen, we have been able to keep some of the perks up. Uh, thanks to Indiegogo, and if you would like to get that exclusive episode of Dear Hank and John that is only available through the Project for Awesome, you can still do that at projectforawesome.com slash donate. Mmm. Great. Mmm. Delicious bonus episode. So go ahead and do that. Projectforawesome.com slash donate. It's gonna taste like ice cream. What flavor? Justice. What's gonna taste like ice cream? Donating to charity? Yeah, or uh, or just the podcast, the exclusive podcast you're gonna get. Oh, sure. It's kind of going to be a flavorful podcast. Is there any way we could move on to the short poem of the day? <laughs> That's fine with me. I mean, there's a bunch of short poems today that I'm that I'm thinking about, Hank, but I think I'm going to go with uh, He Tells Her by Wendy Cope. Are you familiar with this poem? I don't think so. It's the world's best poem about mansplaining. Are you familiar with mansplaining? I sure am. Okay. Uh, this is called He Tells Her by Wendy Cope. He tells her that the earth is flat. He knows the facts, and that is that. In altercations fierce and long, she tries her best to prove him wrong. But he has learned to argue well. He calls her arguments unsound and often asks her not to yell. She cannot win. He stands his ground. The planet goes on being round. Boom! Drop the mic. It is indeed a boom-worthy poem, Hank. I think boom is the only response to that great poem he tells her by Wendy Cope. Oh, yeah. Uh, what else do we do in the beginning of the podcast? I feel like we got we got through the beginning real fast. Usually we talk about some of our drama, some of our difficulties in life, but I'm not really feeling that. I'm feeling so good after the Project for Awesome. I got a bunch of shirts I'm going to send to people. I've been painting Hankler fish art. I'm a little overwhelmed. I'm a little bit behind with work, but, you know, so am I always. So that's, uh, yeah, I just, maybe we should just go on with the questions. Yeah, you sound, you sound wound up pretty tight, but I like, I like tightly wound Hank. Uh, let's start. Well, I also I downloaded I downloaded Dub Smash this morning, so I'm just very excited about Dub Smash. You know, uh, my friend Cara Delevingne was huge into Dub Smash when we were promoting the Paper Towns movie, and uh, she showed it to me, and we did a bunch of them together. Um, and she kept asking if she could put them on Instagram, and I kept saying no. Um, so somewhere on Kara's phone are some very very damaging Dub Smashes of Kara and me oh, singing man. to various songs. That is a beautiful potential Project for Awesome perk that I wish I had known about before now. No, 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 never. Um, let's answer some <laughs> questions from readers, Hank. All right, let's do that. Let's begin with this question from Sloan, Hank, who writes, Dear John and Hank, my boyfriend is not able to get home to spend the holidays with his family this year. My parents decided to invite him to spend Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with my family. I'm very excited about this, but I'm also nervous about it being awkward for him because my family is very close and we have lots of traditions. Do you have any advice for how my family and I can make him feel comfortable? Oh, well, I think you guys should get matching sweaters. All, all of you. yes. It's basically one step away from an engagement, so it's it's quite it's quite a commitment to make. But if you all got matching sweaters, I think he'd feel like part of the family. I would argue that getting matching sweaters is, in fact, far more of a commitment than an engagement. It's easy to walk away from an engagement. Walking away from ma- matching <laughs> sweaters is almost impossible. Well, I mean, just being part of somebody's Christmas photos too, like that, might be a thing that happens. You're gonna wear matching sweaters. You're gonna be in front of the Christmas tree. You're gonna set the timer for ten seconds, and you're gonna stand there awkwardly smiling, being like, "How could this possibly be ten? seconds it's gone on forever and then finally it clicks and i mean basically you're married yeah well i mean i have uh two different uh former partners as you know hank who uh were invited to christmases over the years and who ended up not becoming spouses and indeed my main conclusion from having been on both sides of this coin both the person who welcomes in uh a non-married uh partner to a or a, like a non-committed, long-term committed partner to a Christmas and the person who like goes to someone else's Christmas. My main conclusion uh, is that uh, you don't really need to welcome them uh, because if they are going to be a good fit, 
they will just be a good fit. Like, it'll just work. Because, you know, I suspect that your boyfriend will treat this as a sort of anthropological experiment. You know, he's mostly going to be bearing witness <laughs> to these weird holiday traditions that you and your family have put together over the years. And, um, and there's something really fun about doing that. Like, there's something fun about seeing someone you love in a completely new context. Indeed. Uh, it may be awkward, but I think that... Uh, I think that it depends on, obviously, how he approaches the situation, but I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be a fun time, and the fact that you're uh, you're concerned about it and you're thinking about it means you probably are going to be well prepared for it. We've got another question. This one is from Kelly, who asks, uh, With Lin-Manuel Miranda being a 2015 MacArthur Fellow and the success of Hamilton, I was curious as to what historical figure you think might make a great musical. Hip-hop has made an impact with Hamilton. Is there any genre of music you would like to see brought to the stage? Yes. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say, like, what's the historical figure and the genre of music you want to see them paired with, John? Sure. No, for me, it's definitely uh, the barbershop quartet take on the life of Genghis Khan. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm I'm actually not even going to try to trademark or copyright that idea. Broadway producers <laughs> who also listen to Dear Hank and John, you are more than welcome to go ahead and make that. The Barbershop Quartet Genghis Khan. Well, John, I was going to tell you mine, but it seems so pathetic and pale in comparison that it will just seem like I'm trying too hard. So we're going to move on and just stick with Barbershop Quartet of Genghis Khan because that's way better than my idea. <laughs> All right. I, uh, I will... I, I will I will bask in the glory of my victory and ask you this question, <laughs> um, which comes from Matt. Dear John and Hank, in your last podcast, you mentioned that Dear Hank and John is now sponsored by its listeners via Patreon. Will the questions asked on the normal podcast uh, be from patrons only or from non-supporting listeners as well? I.e., do I have to pay to get my question answered? Great question, Matt, that you didn't pay to get answered. Um, <laughs> indeed... Uh, no, I don't really like, uh, I mean, I guess I can see the benefit of that, but, you know, from my perspective, this podcast is supposed to be sort of open to, equally open to all, um, and anything that we do on the Patreon is just kind of a bonus that isn't really related to the core product. That's also how we treat uh, the SciShow and Crash Course Patreons, you know, the idea is more of an NPR style uh, model where some listeners support it so that all listeners can enjoy it. Indeed, indeed. And I want to say you are not the only person who uh, has had that question, but I, it's, it's possible that we will, we will subconsciously accidentally do this, and we will do our best not to. Uh, but, you know, we, we will be looking at the questions from the Patreon and the questions from the email, just as we also look at questions from Facebook and Twitter, and, uh, and I think also maybe even occasionally Tumblr. Uh, and there are some other people who have general feedback from previous episodes. For example, uh, Liam says, in a recent podcast, you talked about how your drink is on the right when you are seated formally. If you make a circle with your thumb and index finger, it forms a D on the right hand and a B on the left hand for drink, your drink mm -hmm. being on the right, and your bagel, your bagel mm. being on the left. Uh, or bread, or mm -hmm. any type of bread, whatever type of bread it is. Usually when I go to a fancy dinner, though, it's my drink on the left and my bagel on, or my drink on the right and my bagel, bagel on the left. How often do you go to fancy dinners with bagels? Uh, all the fanciest, best fancy dinners have bagels instead of like, just like what? Just like bread, like a roll? That's just, come on. You get a whole bagel if it's a fancy dinner. I don't usually like to criticize your... Um your, your lack of understanding of proper luxury, Hank, because in general, I think that it is a character asset rather um, than a character flaw. <laughs> but if I may ask you a personal question, how many total Michelin stars uh, have the restaurants that you've eaten in your life accrued? Well, I do know that a lot of my favorite restaurants have Michelin tires. <laughs> You have hurt my feelings as uh, as someone who values proper luxury. Uh, you have made me call into question my entire worldview. Let's move on to a question from Caitlin who asks, Dear John and Hank, why are mini M&Ms so much more delicious than regular M&Ms? Uh, that's actually well, for, for, a math question. Yeah, it's just wrong. 
It's it is a math question. It's also it's also false. Yeah. It is deeply false. Yeah. Uh, and you are and and like I do not understand the, your ridiculous perspective. However, uh, the the reason why they are worse is that they have a higher surface area to volume right. ratio. Uh, a sphere's volume. Yep. Uh, and I know an M and M is not a sphere, but we're approximating. This is actually the case for any any volume. Is it, it is a cubed uh, factor? So you've, you it's pi. Uh, I think it's pi times four thirds times the radius cubed. Yeah, uh, pretty sure. Uh, whereas the surface area of a sphere, the surface area of it, whereas the surface area of a sphere. <laughs> Whereas the surface area of a sphere is pi r squared, so as r goes up, as the radius of the sphere goes up, the volume increases, increases much faster as it is the cube uh, rather than the surface area, which is just a square. So bigger M&Ms have less candy shell uh, per unit of chocolate than smaller M&Ms. They try, actually try to make up for this by making the, the candy coating thinner on mini M&Ms, which to me is like that also makes it worse because you get less crunch and also you get more like uh, food coloring per unit of candy, mm-hmm. which can't be good. I don't know if that actually affects the taste, but it seems like it would. Uh, but in a bigger M&M, there is much more chocolate per unit of candy, which I think is better. It obviously changes the taste sub- substantially. If uh, Apparently you, Caitlin, like more candy in your M&M, which is just a ridiculous position to have. To summarize, uh, Caitlin, um, the order is uh, mini M&Ms are the worst. Regular M&M's are the second to worst, <laughs> and peanut M&M's are the single greatest achievement in the history of human beings. You know the great thing about peanut M&M's, John, is that in addition to being a fantastic candy, they are also a really great food. I'd, I'd eat, eat a bowl of those for dinner mm-hmm. with my, with my yeah, no, bagel, well, yeah, my no, bagel on the left. They've got everything that you need. They've got the yeah. protein, they've got the fat, they've got the sugar. I don't think there's anything else that you... T- I wonder how long you could stay alive on just peanut M&M's. You know, probably a pretty long time. I bet there's some some essential fatty acids you're not getting. Uh, maybe some mm-hmm. maybe some some vitamins and minerals you're not quite squeezing in there. Probably not a lot of vitamin C in an M and M. But maybe yeah, you, you might could, get scurvy eventually. You could fortify one. I'd like to see a bowl of fortified uh, with like you know some iodine and some you know maybe a little bit of vitamin C, vitamin D. Uh, just you know in my bowl of uh, peanut M and M's <laughs> that I have at dinner with with uh, you know with my drink on the on the right and my bagel on the left. Oh, you sound like uh, very, very enthusiastic about the world, Hank. Like you might be on speed. (laughs) This question is from Rebecca, who asks, Dear Hank and John, While preparing dinner tonight, I removed a previously opened jar of pizza sauce from the refrigerator and noticed a single spot of mold on the interior side of the jar. The sauce remaining at the bottom of the jar appeared to have no mold on it at all. Can I still put the sauce on my pizza, or does that spot of mold on the side of the jar render all of its contents unusable? Um, What a great question. Let me answer your question with a question. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Of course it renders the entire jar of pizza sauce unusable. I just, you can't I, even recycle <laughs> that jar of pizza sauce. <laughs> you have to throw it away immediately. Take the trash bag that you have thrown it away in, put that trash bag in your exterior uh, trash receptacle, and then just try to forget that the whole thing ever happened. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm glad to know that this this is the occasion which which required the very first bleeping on a dear Hank and John. Uh, I <laughs> I I will agree with John though. I will say it is probably not a good idea. Uh, so so molds are are fungi and uh, they work in mysterious ways. The the mold that you can see is not 100% or even the majority of the mold that's in there. Uh, Molds, by the time you can see them, are producing tons of spores, which are flying all over the place and have probably started colonies that are currently invisible elsewhere. The mold actually has to penetrate into the food a little bit before it starts producing visible, uh, like, the spore bodies that are are the fuzzy things that you actually see. and usually, like, this is fine. In small quantities, mold is not a big deal, uh, but there are certain molds that can be more dangerous. They produce toxins that uh, can make you sick. So the, the, the safe thing is the garbage. Uh, you probably only have to just close the jar, though, and put it in the garbage and not worry about uh, 
Or, or you could even wash it out. You don't have to worry about touching the mold. Uh, it's just it's just the eating it. But if you're John, though, I suggest doing exactly what makes you feel safe. Hank, this uh, seems like a good time to bring up the fact that uh, in answer to uh, several people's requests, I have compiled my top 10 causes of eschatological anxiety. That is anxiety about the end of the world. Okay. Are you ready? And tell me if you think that this order, I mean, this is a genuine order. Tell me if you think this, this order makes sense to you. Okay. Number one apocalyptic bird flu and or flu caused by a different animal. Number two, solar flare. Number three, nuclear war that dramatically reduces the populations of, population of humans. Number four, disappearance of Earth's magnetic fields. Number five, number five, weaponized hemorrhagic virus like Ebola, but weaponized. Number six, volcanic super eruption. Number seven, unexpected asteroid. Number eight, artificial intelligence run amok, which I call the Terminator scenario. Number Number nine, nanotechnology run amok, which I call the gray goo scenario. And number 10, my personal death. (laughs) Well, of all of those, I'll say if we're talking about the likeliness, it's definitely you should start with your your personal death, which I think is more likely than any of those things, which is a which is great news for the whole rest of the world. But bad news for you. No, it's the worst possible news for me. Well, well, except that maybe you would die in all of those other scenarios. So maybe uh, maybe it's it's uh, it's basically like your personal death would occur in any of those scenarios. So, of course, right. it would be the most likely of all of them. OK. <clears throat> all right. So I'm. I'm moving 10 to 1. Is there anything else that you would change? You know, I might move some of those things around, but they're all pretty good uh, scenarios. In general, I tend to fear human things more than I fear uh, natural things because natural yeah. things happen on very long time scales and, and there's very little you can do about them, uh, though there are some things, certainly, that, that we're starting to uh, prepare for, for certain of these eventualities. But... Um, yeah, I, I feel like humans are really unpredictable, and I feel especially like uh, with the advancing, like the the, qu- the the rapid advance in science, you start to see potentials for people who don't have a ton of training uh, being able to, as you say, weaponize something like hemorrhagic fever, which would be real bad. Um, and mm-hmm. and and uh, and maybe even to the to the point of like uh, intentionally designing a flu that would be very dangerous and uh, mm-hmm. and and then and re- and then intentionally releasing that flu. That's the kind of thing like that we have done. We've intentionally designed extraordinarily dangerous flus. Yeah. Basically so that we can study how to treat them if they were to happen naturally. Yeah. But the fact that that now we know that we can intentionally designed very dangerous flus it seems like how far are we away from a point where that can be done at a laboratory that is not regulated and is owned or run by a small group of crazy people well to be fair i think i think that is inclusive of my number one concern apocalyptic bird flu um yeah i mean i think that apocalyptic bird flu uh and and intentionally weaponized bird uh intentionally weaponized uh, artificial flu are kind of two separate things just like weaponized hemorrhagic fever is is different all right i mean i'm gonna go with one and one a then i'm not gonna I, i'm not gonna mess around my whole <laughs> list just 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 for that one little observation well that you made. uh and in general like that's that's something that scares me a lot uh and so i want to make sure that it's also scaring you because if, if it's scaring me and it's not scaring you then there's definitely something wrong that's great to hear thank you for um thank you for that <laughs> feedback um about me as a person uh i have another question for you hank it comes from chrissy who asks dear john and hank I've just listened to one of your podcasts where you were talking about how they have discovered water on Mars and how that means there is a possibility of life there. My question is, how do we know that if there is life on Mars, it would be dependent upon water like we are? Wouldn't it be possible that they would be completely different from any other life form we know of? Um, yeah, I, this is so this is a question that I've I've thought you know, spent a fair amount of time talking about it. It's also another science question. I feel like we've had a lot of questions that could be answered with science this podcast. So I appreciate that because it means that I will talk more and John will talk less. Unless you, John, want to take this one. No. <laughs> Thank you, though. Chemistry works best, first of all, in a liquid. 
liquids uh, are they they have a lot of different interactions between all of the particles in the liquid. So all the molecules and atoms in the liquids will interact more frequently. Uh, and so liquid chemistry just a lot more gets done than in a gas where particles run into each other less often, or in a solid where they don't move around. They all stay in the same place in the same same order. So liquid chemistry is just good chemistry, and we think that in order for life to happen at the moment, like we think that in order for life to happen, there has to be good chemistry happening. So if we're saying that the life is based on chemistry and not on something Thing else weird like plasma physics or something like that, uh, then we're gonna we're focused on liquids and water is a particularly good liquid for uh, this kind of chemistry to happen because it uh, it is polar and thus many different things can dissolve in it. Uh, so stuff's really good at dissolving in water, uh, particularly uh, various carbon compounds that uh, we think that are. are are sort of the basis of how our life works. But in general, there's just lots of stuff that can dissolve in water. And at, like certainly all of life on Earth is based on water chemistry. But we think that water chemistry is just sort of the the, the kind of chemistry that can have the most interesting, uh, like the, the most like interesting products. You can just get a lot. You can get a lot out of water chemistry. Now, there's also the possibility that much different pressures and temperatures than you have like liquid uh, methane, which you could have uh, maybe some kind of interesting chemistry going on there. But methane is nonpolar, so less stuff can dissolve in it. But still some co stuff can dissolve in it. And so maybe there would be chemistry based on liquid methane that could result in life. But uh, but liquid water is uh, not just, it's not just a personal bias. It's not just us saying like, well, all the life we've ever seen is based on liquid water, so it must be. It's also that we know how chemistry works. We do a lot of chemistry ba based on a lot of different things in our world. Uh, and, and liquid water chemistry remains the, like, where a huge, like, vast variety of interesting chemistry gets done. Hank, I have to tell you that of all the sentences you've ever said that aren't dirty, Liquid chemistry is just good chemistry is the one that sounds the dirtiest. <laughs> I don't even know why exactly, but when you said it, you said it like four different times, and each time you said it, it sounded dirtier and dirtier. <laughs> I apologize. Hank, it... um, I have breaking news from the world of Dear Hank and John, or as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. It comes from Linus in Sweden who writes, Dear John and Hank, I am currently listening to the latest episode of your podcast, and in the discussion about how to equally distribute armchairs among, for example, moviegoers, I felt I had to point out that here in Sweden, we have already solved this problem, at least in movie theaters. It is based on the same principle that John has. Everyone, starting from the far right side of each row, is given control of the armrest to their right. Well, how to make sure that everyone follows this? On every armrest, there is a white arrow pointing to the chair on its left side. This simple use of an international and translinguistic symbol allows everyone in the movie theater, no matter age or spoken language, to know clearly which armrest is theirs to use. Hank, Sweden has solved the armrest crisis. I mean... I just need to ask Linus, if you walk into the movie theater, is there, are there always people lined up on the left-hand side because they get both armrests? So you walk in, and like <laughs> at, at the beginning, you're like, everybody's like, oh, I got to get this, so I get both armrests. Uh, and I also have to ask <laughs> Linus uh, if, uh, if Sweden is as dreamy and beautiful as it sounds, and also if possibly Swedish people went into the future and listened to our podcast and then brought that back as a policy, yep. or maybe or maybe they just went into the future where that is a common thing because of our yep. podcast. I just want to yep. be sure that we can we can definitely take credit for this. And I also want to say in, in regards to just generally re discussing previous podcasts, I like this trend. We've done it several times this episode. And I have to say, oh my God, it's burning. That's funny because I am going to Charizard this mofo. <laughs> That's why it's burning due to my, my Charizard. That is fantastic news about Sweden. This podcast is brought to you by Swedes. Time-traveling, left-hander-hating, uh, 
efficiency loving Swedes. Oh, Sweden. It is true, Hank, that if anybody has a time machine, it's almost definitely Sweden. And of course, this podcast is also brought to you by Liquid Chemistry. Liquid Chemistry. It's good chemistry. (laughs) This podcast is brought to you by Matching Sweaters, Basically Marriage. And of course, this podcast is also brought to you by the new hit Broadway play, Barbershop Genghis. (laughs) All right, let's do one more question, John. Do Do you have one ready? I don't. Hank, have you noticed that I'm trying exceptionally hard to uh, make sure that I speak less than you during this podcast? I, 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 do, I feel like I'm just in a mood to speak more than you anyway, so I don't think you even have to try. This question, Some I have... people call it a mood. Some people call it amphetamines. <laughs> I have another question. This one's from Josh, who asks, Dear Hank and John, I'm reading To Kill a Mockingbird in my freshman English class, and my teacher has used uh, the character Calpurnia to explain a concept called code switching. My teacher defines code switching as talking talking differently, different dialects or personal filters, depending on your listener or environment. My question is, when do you feel the need to code switch? What kind of personal filter do you use when you are talking to each other, your friends? What is the benefit of acknowledging when you are code switching? I have to say that uh, this is something that I did not realize until well into uh, my my 30s. And because of the ability that the Internet has given me to talk to people, lots of people who are not like me, that I code switch all the time. And it is it is one of the like really unthought about privileges of being a white male yeah. that I can code switch constantly and then in the circumstances where I feel like I can't I am so deeply uncomfortable yeah and and I and I feel like and and understanding that like I am uncomfortable when I can't code switch despite the fact that like there are many people who cannot code switch nearly as much as I can uh and uh, that like understanding my discomfort in those situations is like is like really uh sort of uh, has allowed me to understand how difficult it is to not be a white male. Yeah, I mean, I think it, when people talk about um, not understanding uh, what is meant by the phrase white privilege or, or not not seeing it in, in our social order or whatever, I think reading up on code switching is actually really helpful um, because I, I, I completely uh, agree with you um, that it, for me at least uh, it is... An, a, a tremendous example of the privileges that are sort of built in to my identities. Um, and being aware of that is tremendously important because uh, when you aren't aware of it, you just sort of you just sort of think that the universe is is tilted in a particular way and it's it's your way. and that that seems like the honest or real or fair way of the world um, because it's the mm-hmm. current way of the world. Um, and Yeah. So I think that's I actually think that's really interesting. The character of Calpurnia in To Kill a Mockingbird is one of the most uh, fascinating characters to me. Although Atticus Finch is often hailed as like the greatest hero in the in the history of um, American literature. And I certainly think that Atticus Finch is a is a great and fascinating hero. Um, You know, the the truth about uh, the civil rights movement in the South is that uh, the heroes of it were not white men. uh, in fact, there were very, very, very few Southern white men who, uh, looking back on the civil rights movement, can be considered to have acted heroically. Um, almost all, almost all of the heroes of the civil rights movement in the South were the African American people who were resisting in various ways um, and, you know, establishing rights um, that that had not been given them by the state, which is an extremely difficult thing to do. And Calperny is a fascinating character in that context yeah yeah and and in in sort of deeper answer to your question your actual question uh yeah i I find myself code switching like i just like moment to moment i i kind of am disturbed occasionally by how chameleon-y i can be and just sort of like if i'm like suddenly at a fancy dinner or if i'm the like one moment i'm the boss and the next moment i'm a friend and and the the linguistic ways that i do that and that i make that clear to other people around me when i'm when i'm trying to be because i i i'm friends with a lot of my employees and so the like there are you know, there's certainly like physical contexts, uh, like if we're at work um, versus at a bar, but there are also linguistic contexts and, and like 
the and and it's very subconscious and i don't really know that i'm doing it but i can I- identify it when i do uh and it's it's a really nice thing to be able to do so easily and sometimes it disturbs me i have a great uh, southern accent when i go uh back to the south um that my wife will look at me and be like what 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 <laughs> And I'll just be like, oh, no, this is just, this is normal. This is how I talk. I talk like <laughs> no, this all the time. No, and she's no, like, no, 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 you don't. All right, Hank, let's move on to the news from Mars and to AFC Wimbledon. Um, the news from AFC Wimbledon is so incredibly exciting. I just can't wait, Hank. I can't wait for okay. the news from Mars. Uh, well, go for it. Last week, Hank, I spent uh, more than two hours watching an internet live stream of a town council meeting occurring in South London. I watched as local government representatives asked questions about how the garbage would be taken out, how many parking spots there would be, how many of these parking spots would be reserved uh, for people with disabilities. And I heard them ask questions about how the garbage would be taken out and how many parking spots there would be and how many housing units and whether those housing units would have built-in air conditioning. Hank, (laughs) I watched as these members of the Merton Council asked hundreds of questions. I formed opinions about the local Mm -hmm. government representation in South London that are far firmer than the opinions I have about my local representatives here in Indianapolis, whomever they may be. I have no idea. Um, (laughs) I I watched as hundreds of AFC Wimbledon fans uh, sitting there... um, waited to find out if the town council was going to approve their plan to build a new stadium in their historic home, bringing league football back to Wimbledon after the great injustice of 2001. And I watched and wept as the town council voted unanimously to agree that they can build a stadium. It is a huge moment in the history of AFC Wimbledon, Hank. This is the end of a vital part of the journey. This is the moment when they get to come home. Um, Wimbledon fans sing a song, uh, Show Me the Way to Plow Lane. They've been singing it since they were forced uh, from their stadium uh, more than 30 years ago. Uh, And, you know, through reforming this club, starting out in a public park, working their way up through the non-league uh, ranks into league football. They have shown the world the way to Plow Lane, and I'm so proud to be a fan and, and sponsor of AFC Wimbledon right now. They're going to get to build a stadium. It's going to be a beautiful stadium. It's going to be so fancy, there's no way I'll ever get to sponsor it when they move into <laughs> the new stadium. And I am so excited. I am so excited for the day when I cannot afford to be a sponsor of this great football club. So it was a huge moment in the club's history, and the unanimous vote uh, was really just a moving moment. I mean, many, many AFC Wimbledon fans compared it to the moment they um, won uh, the the playoff uh, to go back into the football league. That's how important it was uh, to Wimbledon fans and uh, and to to the to the future of the club. And I'm just thrilled for them. There's a lot of work ahead. Obviously, they've got to raise a ton of money um, to uh, to build the stadium, but they're going to be able to do it. I know it. And I'm just so, so happy. Congratulations, John. And Thank congratulations, you. AFC Wimbledon. I have similarly exciting news that I am similarly uh, bubbling and, ex- and, and like deep in my heart have have butterflies about. With regards to Mars, John, would you yeah. would you like to hear about it? Yeah, but just tell me first, did you weep when you heard it? Uh, just maybe a tiny, tiny bit. I don't even believe you. Well, you will believe me when you hear the news, which is that the first book in Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy oh. is going to be made into a TV series uh, oh. that is going to be written by none other than J. Michael Straczynski, whose credits include Babylon 5 and Thor. Uh, oh, uh, 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 yeah. wow. Yeah, so basically it is really, it is a dream coming true for me. So the Red Mars is the first book in, the, in Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy. It is the book that got me into Mars that... that uh, uh, and, and not only that, wow. but got me into chemistry, got me into science, got me into uh, just, uh, you know, 
basically my entire life path. Kim Stanley Robinson has remained a hero of mine. He has continued to write remarkable books, though in recent years he uh, he has uh, become a, uh, you know, he's always been an environmental advocate, but has become a, a lot less bullish on the idea of having Mars as a backup planet because he uh, wants to be very clear that this is the one we've got and we better do it right. But... Um, yeah, so uh, Red Mars is going to be a TV show, and it's going to have 10 episodes, and they may do the rest, but uh, it's it's not 100% sure. But yeah, it's gonna it's almost 100% going to happen unless like something very, very bad happens. So wow. I'm Hank, extremely excited. I'm extremely four, excited. Somewhere 14-year-old Hank is just having his biggest possible dream come true. Yeah, yeah. No, oh. it's very exciting. I mean, I remember you reading those books, and I had never seen you read like that before. Uh, and indeed, like you've since told me that you never had read like that before. But I mean, I'd never, I'd never seen you care about something um, that way. And it was really, really cool to watch. It was, it really, it truly was transformative in your life, even from the outside. And so I'm, I am genuinely really excited for you. I thought that you were going to come at me with some like boring news about now we can drill a <laughs> mile into the Mars surface or whatever. But that is actually cool. Um, what channel is it going to be on? Uh, it's going to be on Spike TV, which I've left out because I'm just not a big fan of Spike TV. Yeah. What, what, what the hell? Whatever. As long as they do a good job, it doesn't matter. Uh, my, my DVR doesn't know yeah. what channel I'm, I'm recording. <laughs> well, that's exciting. Yep. yep, 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 yep. Hank, before we talk about what we learned today, we need to talk about something else, which is that uh, this is the last podcast uh, of 2015, oh, right. and yes, yes. Uh, we're even taking the first week of 2016 off. We're going on a two-week hiatus so that we can spend some time with our families, enjoy the holidays, and also let our listeners enjoy the holidays. Yes, yes. We don't want to distract you from all of the holidays. And if you want, and if you want and need distraction, there are lots of other podcasts. Uh, would you like to suggest a, an alternate podcast, John? I would like to suggest an alternate podcast. Uh, Serial. <laughs> well, I've actually... Yeah, like, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. I, it's like Dear Hank and John, but um, <laughs> better in every way. Um, I, I would suggest You Must Remember This, which is a History of Hollywood podcast, and, uh, and also Limetown, which you should not listen to at night. It is a, it is a kind of horrifying fictional but but pretending to be non-fiction por- podcast. So Hank, what did we learn today? Uh we learned uh, I don't know. It's good. It's good end of the podcast. It's strong. You delivered there. I appreciate it. <laughs> we learned that uh Red Mars is going to be a TV show. And we learned that uh supporting Dear Hank and John on Patreon while it is certainly welcome patreoncom John does not help you get your questions on the podcast. Indeed, indeed it does not. We learned that uh, tiny M&Ms are not as good as big M&Ms because of math. And we also learned that big M&Ms, because of math and also because of peanuts, are not as good as peanut M&Ms. <laughs> <laughs> pro, pro work, John. Pro work. Thanks, bud. I, I feel like we learned other things today, but you, you guys know what we learned. Yeah. No, I think the most important thing we learned today is that Sweden continues to live in a glorious future. <laughs> glorious, glorious future. They, they need to share that time travel technology with, with the rest of the world. It, it does seem a little, un, a little unfair. The rest of us are stuck in this miserable present, but Sweden has it all, all figured, figured out. out. Except for sunshine. They didn't figure that out yet. <laughs> I don't know a lot about Sweden's weather, John. Well, it's pretty far up there, Hank, so in the winter... Awfully dark. Ah, I see. Well, we've got that going on here in Montana as well. John, thank you for having a podcast with me. No, it's been my distinct pleasure. It's been a very enjoyable 2015 for Dear Hank and John, or as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. We're looking forward to uh, continuing more in 2016. If you have a question for us, you can uh, use Dear Hank and John hashtag on uh, Twitter, where I'm John Green and Hank is Hank Green. You can also email us, hankandjohn at gmail.com. And uh, also, you can find us on our Patreon at patreon.com. Com slash Dear Hank and John. This podcast is edited by Nicholas Jenkins. The theme music is from Gunnarola, and as they say in our hometown, don't, don't forget, forget to, to be, be awesome. awesome.